There's a bunch of cool stuff that you can do in geometry nodes, but if you've never used them, it's difficult to get an idea of what they can actually do. So here are three exercises of useful things that you can do in geometry nodes right now. I'm Dude Blender, and let's jump right in. These examples are gonna be super easy, so feel free to follow along even if you're a beginner and just pause whenever you need to. Showing information in the model. I've used this in a couple of videos where I want a value to be shown in the viewport or even in renders for the audience to see. You might want to show the distance between two points and angle between two vectors and any value that can be passed within geometry nodes. The cool thing is that since it's actual geometry it will show up in renders as opposed to for example just turning on the edge length overlay. Setup is quite simple. First we need to add a mesh. It doesn't really matter what shape you use, we only need a geometry object to be able to contain the node tree. So I will just use a plane. Let's go to the geometry nodes workspace and with our plane selected let's add a new node tree. I'm gonna rename this to value viz. Now if you expand the plane's hierarchy, you'll see that there's a geometry nodes modifier. Let's pin this so that if we select another object, we can still see our node tree. Let's say that we want to visualize the distance between two spheres. Add two UV spheres, scale them down and move them apart. I'm gonna rename them to point one and two. We can bring the information of an object into our node tree by dragging and dropping from the outliner into the editor. An object info node is created with the object already selected. Now I'm gonna get the information of the other sphere into the editor. Now calculating the distance between both objects is very easy. We just need a vector math node, so shift A and we can just start typing the name. Once it shows up in your list you can click on it or just press enter. Now we're gonna set this to distance. Connect both location sockets to the inputs of the vector math node. This output has the information that we want to show in the viewport. Now we need to convert this value to a mesh that we can see in the viewport. There is no value to mesh node, so we need to do a few conversions first. Add a value to string node. We're gonna connect the value to this one and we can define the number of decimals that we need. For me, one is enough, so I can just click here or you can click here and type the number. Now this output will be a string instead of a number, so we can no longer do any math with it. And there's also no string to mesh node, so we're gonna convert the string to a curve first. So let's add a string to curves node. I'm gonna connect the string sockets and you can change any of the parameters here. The fonts, the alignment, the spacing. For now, I'm just gonna leave everything as is. At this point, I'm just gonna connect this to the output. We can see the number and if I go to top view and just count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can confirm that indeed they are seven units apart from each other. Now these are curves and we cannot see them in the renders. In fact, if I turn off the overlays, they just disappear. So we still need to turn this into a mesh. However, at this point, we can see that if we move any of the spheres, the value changes in real time. Our group input that contains the geometry of the plane is not necessary anymore. So we can just go ahead and delete it by selecting it and pressing X. Now there are a couple of nodes that we can use to convert this to a mesh. And it depends whether we want a solid color or only the outline. If you only want the outline, use a curve to mesh node. I'm gonna connect this here and I'm gonna connect a curve circle node to the profile and change the radius to a small number. This is now a mesh, so if I were to render this, we can now see the number. The other way to do it is to connect a fill curve node. I'm gonna connect this here and this one and now we can see the solid number. I actually prefer the outline, so I'm just gonna remove this and replace this setup. Now you can use this exact same setup to show any information that you're passing through the geometry nodes and for some projects this is actually very useful. Now one more thing that you might want to do, let's say that my camera was here and now the numbers are not so easy to see. So something that we could do is just rotate this number so that it's always facing the camera. We do this by dragging the information of the camera into our node editor, add a transform geometry node, I'm gonna put this one here and then just connect the rotation to the rotation. And now no matter where we place the camera, the number will always face it so it's gonna be easier to read. Coding an object with something. So this is one of the most common uses, if not the most common use of geometry nodes. Anytime you need to add instances of something to the surface of an object, such as condensation, glitter, sugar, sprinkles, grass, trees, or anything that you can imagine, you can use the same technique. Let's sprinkle some glitter on a monkey. Let's go ahead and add a monkey. I'm gonna place it here. I'm going to unpin this node tree so that I can create a new one, and I'm gonna rename this to glitter. Let's create a couple of materials in the monkey and let's rename them to monkey and glitter. 
For the monkey material, I'm just gonna use a white color. Now for the glitter material, you should know that it doesn't really matter where we create it, it just needs to exist somewhere in the scene. I'm gonna go to the shading workspace, and now with the glitter material selected, I'm gonna make it metallic, and I'm gonna turn the roughness to 0.1. So this is gonna be a shiny, reflective metallic material. Now we want the different specs of glitter to have different colors, so add a color ramp, connect the color to the base color, and here in the color ramp, add all of the colors that you want your glitter to have. Next we're gonna add an object info node, I'm gonna place it here and connect the random to FAC. This way each instance of the glitter will select a random place within the ramp and will apply that color to that speck of glitter. That means that if you want the color to be predominant, you just need to leave a larger proportion within the ramp. So in this example there would be more light blue glitter specks than any other color. Alright, let's go back to our Geometry Nodes workspace and first we need to tell Blender where to instance the glitters. Blender treats vertices as points, so if we just instance anything now, it would just create the glitter exactly where the vertices are. So we're gonna add a Distribute Point on Faces node and connect it here. Now you'll see that there are points along the whole geometry of the monkey. Also the monkey is gone because now this group input, which is the geometry of the monkey, is not connected directly to the group output. So we need to add a join geometry node, place it here, and then connect this one also to that join geometry. Now we have both the monkey and the points being joined together and sent to the output. Now we need to have a shape to instance in each of the points. So to make it very simple and very quick, I'm just gonna add a cube. And this is gonna be the shape of our glitter. You can of course change it to whatever you want. I'm gonna change the size to 0.5 centimeters. And now we need to instance a cube in each of the points. To do that, we need an instance on points node. We're gonna connect this here. You see that the points have disappeared because it's instancing nothing on each point. So it's replacing each point by nothing. But we want a cube, so we're gonna connect this mesh to the instance socket. Now if I zoom in, you can see the glitter specs. Of course, this looks very empty and it's not enough, so we need to increase the density. Now keep in mind that each instance is new geometry. So if you go crazy and change the density to 10 million, it will crash your computer. So if you've never done it and don't know what your computer can handle, you can increase the density a little bit more carefully. So this is 10, I'm just gonna go to a thousand. The lower the number that achieves what you're looking for, the better. I think this is still too little, so I'm gonna change this to 4,000 and I think that might be enough. Now all of the glitters are exactly of the same size and the orientation is the exact same, so it really doesn't look good. So we want to change the size of each speck of glitter and also its rotation. So we're going to add a random value node, I'm going to place it here and I'm going to connect this to the scale. So what this is doing now is multiplying the scale of each glitter speck times a random number between 0 and 1. I don't want them to be so small that we cannot see them, so my min is going to go to 0.5. In fact, I might want a little bit more variation, so I'm going to change it to 0.3. Now we have some differentiation. The second thing is we're going to duplicate this one and we're going to change this from float to vector. I'm going to move these around to make some space. And now I'm going to connect this value to rotation. And now there's a lot of randomness in our glitter, which is what we want. Now we need to add our glitter material to the instances and the way to do that is with a set material node that we're gonna connect here. This way we're gonna apply the material only to the instances and not to the actual monkey. We select the glitter material and we're pretty much done. I'm gonna give this a render and I think that for the exercise this looks okay. You can of course make the instances smaller, change their shape, add more of them and adjust it to something that you like. There's a trick I want to show you because it's very powerful. Let's say that it feels strange for the monkey to have glitter on its eyeballs. So I don't want that, but I just want to remove the glitter from this area and leave the rest as it is. So let's go to the UV editing workspace and go where my monkey is. We're going to change this from edit mode to weight paint. And what we do here is exactly that. We paint the weight of each of the vertices. It defaults to blue, which is a zero. So now if I start painting, you'll see that it adds a vertex group. This group will contain the information of the value of the weight of each of the vertices. So I'm gonna go to wireframe mode because that way it's easier to know where 
vertices are and let's say I want to paint this vertex and you'll see it turns red because I have the brush weight on one. Note that you're actually painting the vertices. If I paint here on the face where there is no vertices nothing happens but if I paint let's say here where there's another vertex again it changes and I can change the weight of each vertex to get the exact value that I want. Now I'm gonna go back to geometry nodes and I want to have a way to use that information from the weight paint to inform the density distribution. The easiest way to do that is to connect the density to this empty socket in the group input. This gives you access to this value from the modifier stack. You'll see that we have density here and it has a 4000 value that we gave it before. If I click on this button and then click here again, I can select the group that was created before. Now this is a vertex group. We can see it if we go here to data and any vertex groups that we had would be here. I'm just gonna change the name to density dist for distribution. And I'm gonna go back to the modifier stack. I'm gonna select it again and I'm telling Blender to distribute points based on the weight of each node. I'm gonna back to UV editing, change this to weight paint. Then before we start painting, you need to know that blue equals zero. So for example, this vertex has the weight of zero and red is one. So the weight of this vertex is one. I'm gonna go back to geometry nodes. And if I just connect it like this, then the highest density would be one, which is very small since before we had 4000. So I'm just going to multiply the density by that number. I'm going to add a math node. I'm going to connect it here and then I'm going to change this from add to multiply. I'm going to change this value to 4000 and you can immediately see that where I painted red the distribution is now what we want but everything else that is in blue is zero so there is no distribution of points anywhere else. Let's go back to UV editing again change this to white paint and now we want most of this to be red and only the eyes to be blue so I'm just going to paint paint this blue again so that everything is blue and then just go to weights invert and the color is kind of bright but now you can see that it's instancing glitter everywhere in the monkey now we only want to change the weight of the eyes make sure that this weight is on zero and we can just start painting i'm gonna do the other eye as well and I just, i'm just gonna leave it like this and i'm gonna go back to the geometry nose workspace because that red color is completely ruining my eyesight so now we can see that whatever we painted in blue doesn't have any glitter and then with this technique we can very accurately define where we want to install the glitter. The third useful thing and final for this video that you can do is animate. This is a beginner's tutorial so we're not gonna get into simulations but we'll use some very simple math to describe movement. Let's add a sphere, I'm gonna move it here, uh, let's add a new node tree. We're gonna call this Anim. We're gonna try to animate the sphere only using geometry nodes. The way we're gonna do it is with a transform geometry node and we're gonna connect this here. This is the node that will actually be doing all of the movement, basically changing the translation values. And the way we change them is we somehow link them to the frame that we're in. So when we run our animation, something will happen to the sphere. To access the frame data, we just need to add a value node and in the value, we're gonna type hash frame. You'll note that it turns purple, which means that it has just created a driver. In fact, if I right click on it and click on open drivers editor, I can see some information here. I have an intro to drivers video if you want to know what that is. But for now, it's enough to know that there's a driver involved and this node will take the value of the current frame. So the simplest way to animate this is just to connect the frame directly to the translation socket. Now, if I play the animation by pressing spacebar, you'll see that the sphere moves. It's disappeared. Oh, here it is. And it disappears because it's moving too fast. It's moving one meter per frame. And it's moving in that direction because that's where all axes are positive. If I want to slow down the animation, well, there are a couple of things I can do. Since this is already a driver, I can actually make some math directly here. So if I write frame divided by 100, and now if I play the animation, you'll see that it's moving 100 times slower than before. And I can change this to 10, and I play again, and it moves at that speed. The second way I can do, if I don't want to do this, is add a math node connected here, then I can set this to divide. I can divide this by 10 again, and now if I play the animation again, we see the same result. Shift left arrow takes you to the first frame. Now this really opens a world of possibilities. So how would you make the sphere move up and down? 
down with what you've learned. Well, we can easily do this with a couple of nodes. Add a combine XYZ node. We're gonna connect this to translation. And here, again, because it's purple, there's a driver and we can add a math expression. And what I wanna do is use a sine wave. So the expression to use a sine is just SIN and then in parentheses, frame. I'm gonna connect this to the Z socket in the combine XYZ node so that it only affects that direction. So it's gonna move zero in X and Y and in Z it's gonna move whatever this expression says. So if I press space, it's doing what we want it to. And again, I could divide this by 10 if I wanted to so that I slow down the movement. And in the same way, if we didn't want to use that expression, we could add a math node connected here set it to sine, and now if I play the animation, it does that again. I could also add a divide node, divide by 10, and we would see the exact same thing as before. So the cool thing about this is that anything that we can describe with simple math, we can use that to describe the movement. We can even set conditions of the movement through other objects in the scene. I'm going to add an empty. Move my empty here, go to top view, see where it is. I'm gonna move it to this location. Again, I'm gonna bring the information of the empty into my node tree. I can use this to inform the direction of movement of the sphere. I'm gonna change this to relative so that it uses relative position to the sphere. I'm gonna duplicate this and I'm gonna select the sphere. Now with these two, I can calculate the direction to where the sphere would need to move in order to reach the empty. I'm gonna delete these. Now we're gonna add a vector math node. And as you can see, there's a bunch of things we can do with math. I'm gonna connect both the location of the empty and the location of the sphere. I'm gonna subtract both vectors. This will give me a vector with the direction where the sphere needs to move in order to go towards the empty. Duplicate this. I'm gonna set this to normalize and I'm gonna connect this vector. What I'm doing now is I don't know the magnitude of this vector. And when I normalize it, I know that this vector contains the information of the direction but with a magnitude of one that helps me to control the speed now we duplicate this again we're gonna set this to scale we're gonna connect this vector and this vector to translation so this is the direction and this is the speed we're gonna connect our frame to the scale now if we play the animation i'm gonna go to top view i'm gonna move this again if we play the animation we can see that the sphere moves in the direction of the empty and again if it's moving too fast you already know what we would do at a math node connected here set this to divide and divide it let's say by 10. play the animation and now the sphere is moving slowly now one thing to know is that this is a very simple animation and it's not a simulation so if i play the animation and while the animation is playing i move the empty you'll see that it completely recalculates the location of the sphere. That's because with this setup we don't know the current position of the sphere. This node gives us the position of the origin, so we're calculating with this point. We don't know at any point where the geometry of the sphere actually is, so we cannot make it look as if it's following or chasing the empty. We could do that with simulation nodes, but I'm gonna leave that for another video. And there you have it, three very useful things that you can easily do with geometry nodes. I'm Dude Blender, happy blending.